Great, well welcome and good afternoon everyone. I'm so glad you could join us today. My name is Alexa Tatarian and I'm with Nelson Laboratories. We're based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. And today we're going to be talking about process validations for newly manufactured devices and answering the question, is your new device clean? So this presentation is going to be very helpful for manufacturers, talking about what the device cleanliness is, why it's important, and then finally, we'll touch a little bit on how to go about measuring that cleanliness on the device. So the, the clinical significance for this testing in the med tech industry is, you know, when I talk to a lot of clients that we work with and I'm asking, how are you measuring the cleanliness of your device? They say, oh, you know, we're, we're testing bio burden, cytotoxicity, and those are great tests to help you show that you're manufacturing clean devices. However, just because a device is sterile, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's clean. And cleanliness is actually its whole separate entity of testing in addition to sterility and biocompatibility. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. I like to mention a recall that was, uh, it's been a few years ago now, but the company was uh, Sulzer, if you're familiar with that recall. They were a manufacturer of orthopedic hip implants. And it turns out that on the acetabular cut portion of this hip implant, oil residue was being left behind on this device. And when implanted into the patient, the implant could not grow and integrate in with the bone of the patient because that oil was creating a barrier. And so oddly enough, the device was sterile and it was passing all of the biocompatibility tests, but that oil was being left behind and interfering with the function of the device. And so that's why cleanliness is important and what we're going to be talking about today. So the what is, what is device cleanliness, it's what we're gonna be talking about today and how it's separate from sterility and biocompatibility. The standard information for this testing, uh, it's a GMP or good manufacturing practice for manufacturers to have procedures in place for the use and removal of manufacturing material. There's also an ASTM standard F2847 that we reference that lists a wide variety of test options available to measure device cleanliness. There's also a working document that ASTM has right now that's a new guide for validating clean lies for medical devices. And this is going to be coming out in the very, very near future. But this standard is going to be very, very helpful for manufacturers on how to go about setting uh, acceptance criteria as well as a plan to validate your manufacturing process. There's also another working document in place for establishing limit values, and that standard will be very beneficial for manufacturers as well when it comes out. So from a regulatory perspective, we talked about recalls earlier. You know, recalls are very important to avoid for manufacturers, and there could be liability from these residues being left behind if they were introduced into the patient to cause an adverse effect. We've also seen a, a high increase in awareness on good manufacturing practice audits from regulatory reviewers, including FDA. We're seeing FDA require manufacturers to have this data on file and be asking for it more and more often. And so we have seen definitely just an overall increase in awareness on cleanliness uh, data on file during audits. And so why is this testing important? It's important for patient safety as well as regulatory compliance. This is a mock manufacturing practice um, up on the screen. And this would be, you know, it's just supposed to represent a manufacturing process. And whatever comes in contact with the device should be reduced or removed during cleaning. And so the machining process, you know, maybe there's an oil that's used there that could be left behind. Deburring is a step where it smooths rough, rough edges on devices. So maybe some particulates could be left behind. You know, during a polishing step, maybe there's a polishing compound used there. Uh, in any rough cleaning steps, maybe water's introduced. That water can have microbiological contamination, potentially heavy metals that are introduced. Passivation, perhaps nitric citric acid residuals could be left behind. If any detergents are used or under other cleaning compounds, these could also be left behind. And so to walk through your process like this and see what is introduced, you want to make sure that these residues are either removed or reduced as best as possible through this cleaning validation process. And so looking at your process, seeing what comes in contact with the device, you want to make sure that these are removed during cleaning. It's also important for manufacturers to reduce risk in the process wherever possible. 
And so here's some ideas on how to do that. You could choose biocompatible agents or compounds that are safe on their own before introduced to devices. We're seeing more and more raw material manufacturers market that products on their own are biocompatibility are biocompatible. So maybe you'd click a pick a detergent for your process, for example, that wasn't cytotoxic, or you'd pick an oil that was not causing harm on its own in its raw state. Um, you can also look for compounds to use in the process that are easy to remove. Perhaps you choose compounds that are all water soluble, and so you could just hit it with a really hard water rinse and not have to uh, introduce any other harsh solvents to remove those compounds. It's also important to streamline your process wherever possible. And with this point, I wanna make, you know, I get a lot of questions of, you know, how much detergent do I need to hit my device to get it clean? Or, you know, how much should I use and things like that? And often manufacturers will test high, low, and nominal conditions in their process to see what the proper amount is and to get their products clean. You don't necessarily wanna to use too much to be uh, a concern for that to be left behind. And you wanna really limit the introduction of any unnecessary sources of contamination where possible. So streamlining the process, see if you can limit what goes in there by testing different conditions, possibly grouping together where you can. Uh, that'll really help reduce risk up front if you have this cleaning and cleanliness on your mind at the beginning, making these steps to decide what to be used in your manufacturing and cleaning process. So this is a slide on the how, and we'll just briefly go through these test methods of how to show that your device is clean. And we'll go through just a couple of these test options fairly quickly, but there's a gravimetric extractable residue test. This test quantifies surface residue, such as oils, lubricants, detergents, really anything that's left behind on your device on the surface. And this test reports an overall weight of residue that can be combined into milligram or microgram per device or centimeter squared if you take into account surface area. There's total organic carbon or TOC, another great test to show surface re residue that is water soluble as well as organic carbon based. A lot of detergents and compounds used in the cleaning process fit into this category and make TOC a good test to include in the plan. There's a detergent residual test that's by UV Viz, ultraviolet visible spectroscopy that can quantify the amount of detergent left behind on the device. Particulates is also a good test to quantify insoluble debris. Cytotoxicity is a great test. We talked about it earlier. It can help you show if those residues are cytotoxic. This, these tests together can really show a comprehensive view of cleaning. There's also bioburden to quantify or get a colony forming unit counts of your aerobic bacteria and fungi on the device, as well as bacterial endotoxin, quantify the gram negative bacteria residues that are present on the device. And so you'll, you'll see here we have some tests to quantify as well as cytotoxicity and the tests to look for microbiological contamination. So really all of these tests together give you that comprehensive view where maybe CYTO on its own will give you a good indication of cleanliness, but perhaps isn't the only test that you need to perform. So let's talk a bit about acceptance criteria and how to, how to set this for manufacturers. It could be an option to use positive controls or unclean devices. Hopefully you see a reduction in residue from your unclean to clean devices, and this can help you show that your devices are clean. Historical data, we work with a lot of clients who start trending their data. A lot of these devices are actually on the market before they're asked for this data in an audit or something like that. And so they'll go and trend that data and then set alert and action levels after they observe the levels of residue that are coming back on their devices. The additional tests that we talked about on the previous slide, adding cytotoxicity and tests to measure microbiological contamination, can be helpful to include to show that your device is clean. And it's also been a trend to compare the test data to toxicological data on those compounds. So say you do have a detergent in your process, perhaps previous data has already been studied about harmful levels of, those, of that detergent. And you can compare that to the quantitative data found during testing and make some sort of assessment if the detergent at that level was to be left behind, if it would be safe or not. 
To touch quickly on routine monitoring, you know, it's important to have that initial validation on file, but it's equally important to set routine monitoring and steps to monitor your cleanliness and manufacturing. Schedule weekly, mo uh, schedule routine monitoring. Often you start uh, more frequent at first, maybe go weekly, and then as those levels are coming back acceptable, move to monthly, quarterly, and so on after, after you have established that initial acceptance criteria. And then continue to control that process by setting alert and action levels. For example, with cytotoxicity, a two would be passing, but perhaps that would be an alert level for some people, and a three would be failing, which would then require action, so something like that. It's also important to validate a change. Anytime a change is made, a change to the device, a change to the process, a change in location of manufacturing, anything that's changed should be evaluated and then test data can help you decide whether you accept or reject that change. Also with routine monitoring, you're monitoring your whole manufacturing process and many of the equipment and the machines that you're working with will need maintenance, uh, cleaning themselves on the equipment, maybe it's time to change out the equipment. If you're doing this routine monitoring and measuring these residual levels frequently, that can also help you, you know, monitor your whole manufacturing process and see when it's time to change, change out equipment and things like that to make sure that you're manufacturing clean and safe devices. With sampling plan, you know, it's not often feasible for manufacturers to test every single device that they manufacture. And so it's okay to group when possible. Group uh, worst case, maybe you have a most difficult to clean device and maybe you'll choose that for the validation. Perhaps you have some residuals that are of concern to you and use the process that has those residuals that could be left behind. Also grouping together material types. Perhaps you manufacture a stainless steel or titanium devices and maybe you can have a metal group and keep polymers separate. Uh, grouping with material types, uh, group similar processing. If similar compounds are used in different processing, perhaps you could choose the worst case process for the validation. Also, you can possibly group similar patient contacting devices. You'd probably treat a device with cerebrospinal fluid contact much different than something with just external skin contact. And so grouping wherever possible is definitely acceptable for this type of testing to try and reduce the burden for manufacturers. So hopefully that presentation was helpful, gave you a little taste on manufacturing and cleaning and maybe the importance for manufacturers and a little bit on how to go about uh, validating your manufacturing and cleaning process. Come stop by our booth, Nelson Labs, booth 528. We'll be here all afternoon and today, tomorrow. Come by, stop by. We'd love to talk about your process more in depth. So thank you so much for coming today.